I'll call the meeting to order of State Government Finance Policy and Elections, today being uh, Tuesday, March 8th, 2022. Welcome, everybody. Glad to have you here. And uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, take the roll, Ms. Wilson. Senator Kiffmeyer. Present. Senator Howe. Present. Senator Carlson. Senator Clausen. Present. Senator Fate. Senator Curran. Present. Senator Pratt. Senator Osmick. Present. We have a quorum. Thank you, Ms. Wilson. Appreciate that. So, um, members, today we have um, agenda in regards to Senator Anderson's bill, Senator Housley, Senator Coran. Uh, so we appreciate all of you being here today. And we're going to go ahead and start. Senator Anderson, come on up, and I'll move uh, Senate File 197, uh, Lawful Gambling Organization Audits uh, subject. So welcome to the committee, Senator Anderson. When you're ready your name, your title, and then go ahead and give your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. My name is Senator Bruce Anderson, and I bring to the committee uh, your consideration of Senate file number 197. Deals with related lawful gambling and uh, doing some modifying requirements for annual reports and audits for uh, gambling organizations across the state. Uh, just for information, we have uh, latest statistics. Uh, Nonprofit organizations, over 31,000 here in the state of Minnesota. Uh, 501c3 public charities, over 20,000. Uh, private and public foundations, over uh, 1,600. And other nonprofit organizations, over 9,000. Um, this brings a, a economic impact to the state of Minnesota from a nonprofit sector of uh, re empl employing over 3,000, 300,000. Uh, members uh, of the state's workforce, which is about 14 percent, generates almost $66 billion in annual revenues and holds assets of over $193 billion. Minnesota foundations annually give over $955 million, and Minnesotans give almost $3.4 billion in charity to, in each year, representing about 2.7 percent of the household income uh, in, the state, in, in our families and, and individuals throughout the state. So. The members of this morning, I'm, I'm bringing this here because I've had uh, individuals who have contacted my office uh, from the fact that I serve in the military, veteran organizations, American Legions, VFWs, concerned about the way the audits are being done and things of, uh, of that nature, and I have some testifiers that would uh, testify in regards to this. I also have a uh, proposed amendment that uh, the committee could consider, and uh, with that, Madam Chair, I'll stand for further information. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Anderson. Uh, members, this is the first hearing of this bill. This is an author's amendment, and so I will move the A2 amendment to Senate File 197. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. The A2 to Senate File 197 is adopted. So, Senator um, Anderson, you've, you've um, introduced your bill. I appreciate that. I'm going to have um, Rachel Jenner. Uh, if you come on up, Rachel, I'd like to hear from the allied charities uh, first, um, if we could. Hmm? Okay. If you're on Zoom, then just please come on camera. I see your name there, Rachel. We're not hearing you, though, to let you know. OK. Oh, there you are, Rachel. Uh, we're still not hearing you. You need to check your computer that it's off mute or your Zoom. Pardon? Rachel, just wait. Um, we're not having you come through yet. I appreciate your trying because it lets us know um, we have staff here who are going to. You can go. Okay, it looks like it's coming through. Rachel? 
Yes, not very loud. Uh, we can't hear you real well yet, Rachel. Rachel? And as you may know, we have supported removing the audit requirement or increasing the $750,000 threshold for many years. Um, due to the unique structure of our industry, 85% of our income is returned to players as prizes and never goes to the bank. So for an organization with 750,000 in gross receipts, they would deposit roughly 113,000 after those prizes are paid out. So redefining our gross sales as sales after prizes would put us on a level playing field with other businesses that are meeting the audit threshold. So our industry average of revenue paid out in prizes is 85%. So you can see that many organizations meet the audit threshold, but they don't nearly have 750,000 in income. These audits are costly, and it is a burden for organizations who make $112,000 to engage a CPA and pay for audits that typically range from five to $10,000. So based on our fiscal year 2021, this threshold change would remove the audit requirement from 655 organizations. That would be 655 organizations with thousands more available for their charitable mission. Lawful gambling is a highly regulated industry in Minnesota, and we have audits every two years by the Gambling Control Board, in addition to being audited by the Department of Revenue every three years. And either of those entities can request an audit if they do have concerns about the organization. So we feel that there are abundant safeguards in place to ensure the integrity of lawful gambling in Minnesota without requiring an annual audit. I thank you for working with the charities to bring more money back into our communities, and I appreciate your time today and the opportunity to speak in support of this bill. Thank you very much, Ms. Jenner. I appreciate that. Uh, next we're going to have testifying today is Mr. Fragnito from the Minnesota Society of CPAs. Mr. Fragnito, come on up. Welcome to the committee and your name and title and then proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Gino Fragnito and I'm the Government Relations Director at the Minnesota Society of CPAs. And I'm also the chair of the Minnesota Charitable Gambling Board. And my testimony today is based on my role with the CPA Society and is not the position of the board or the staff. So I just want that on the record, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Fragnito. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, the Minnesota Society of CPAs does have some concerns with the changes that are proposed in the, the amendment to the audit requirements for organizations with lawful gambling licenses and $750,000 in revenue as is the, the new definition. And Madam Chair, if, if we look at the new definition of revenue, and as Ms. Jenner referenced, 85% payout, if we look at $750,000 in revenue as the money that is left after sales minus prizes paid out, that's an organization with about $5 million in sales, which is a lot of cash yeah. in a business that is predominantly run by volunteers in establishments that are serving alcohol oftentimes. And so there are a number of things that potentially could go wrong. And so we do have some concerns about the change in the definition of revenue. Uh, looking at the problems that the audits have discovered, I reached out to some CPAs and one firm got back to me and they would look through their client base and some of the examples that showed up in audits that were conducted by the CPA that the organization did not have any awareness of what was happening. There was situations where the receipts were just flat out stolen. There were receipts where the money was not deposited. There were receipts where checks for pull tab games were, were written. There were situations where bingo coupons were stolen. There was payroll fraud, Madam Chair, and I, I think that's a significant uh, point for these organizations to be aware of. One situation where the gambling manager increased the amount that they were paid without the board's approval and without board knowing. Another situation where the gambling manager put their relatives on the payroll without the board knowing. And so those are the types of things that I, I think the benefit of an audit is, is relevant and would definitely help those organizations to look at their internal controls. And it's another touch point for that board of directors when 
at the end of the year, somebody's looking at it and the gambling manager's work is reviewed, a report is provided to the board of directors for whatever that organization is, and then they can have some checks and balances and look at their internal controls and make sure that the money is, in fact, going to the appropriate places these charities are receiving what they should receive. And I will acknowledge that there is an expense to it, Madam Chair, and looking at the industry average, it's roughly anecdotally from what I've heard from CPA firms, they won't reveal their exact prices for competition reasons, but in the ballpark range of less, 1% or less of gross receipts. So at 750,000, that would be roughly $7,500 is what that audit would cost. Some are less, some are more, that would be the average. So I, I think that there are some ways to provide some financial relief to these charities and there may be some ways to look at tweaking the, the current requirements for the audits and there's a engagement called an, uh, agreed upon procedures which may provide some additional relief. But I think ultimately where the true financial benefit comes to these organizations is with some significant tax relief and looking at that tax structure as it sits today. And with that, Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fragnito. A question I have for you, um, when you mentioned the $750,000, I think that was what was called the gross receipts, uh, but you said that is based upon uh, $5 million. Can you, can you explain that, that $750,000 and $5 million, Sure. what that is? Sure. Today, today, Madam Chair, the definition in statute is $750,000 of gross receipts. So that would mean any money that comes in is counted in that $750,000. What the amendment would do is change that to revenue would be defined as gross receipts subtracting prizes paid out. And so if, that, if I look at the 85% average payout that was referenced earlier by an earlier testifier, if I take $5 million and 15% of that is $750,000. And so that in order to reach that $750,000 in revenue as defined in the amendment, I would need to achieve $5 million in sales. So Mr. Fragnito, as I understand this then, this would greatly reduce the use of audits uh, because that level that triggers an audit would be reduced so much lower. Is that a fair interpretation? Uh, Yes, Madam Chair, that is a fair interpretation. I, I believe it would reduce the, the number of audits between 650 and 700 organizations. Okay. I'm sympathetic to what you're saying in this situation. I look as an audit, especially in a volunteer, a lot of these around the state, a lot of money flowing around, a lot of cash many times, that in these particular situations, I prefer to keep people out of trouble <laughs> and to catch them when they are in a smaller situation. And that's hard to do when you're volunteers. Um, but having somebody from the outside, a neutral third party come in, who can take a look at this, go through all of these things, I think in regards to protecting those who have uh, paid into these and protecting those who the money goes out to 4-H, to baseball organizations, things like that. So losses and issues there um, put the whole purpose for their existence for charitable, not just for gambling, but that these revenues would go out to those um, in that local. That's a tremendous benefit. But I would agree with you, and I've been a big advocate of this, that we need to have more of this uh, money that they raise locally, more of it stay local and not come up to the state. So working on it, still working on it, and we'll see how much progress we make. But for them, um, I see it also. We are going to lay this bill over um, for possible inclusion, and it gives an opportunity then to do a little more work here. Uh, but I want to um, ask, I appreciate what you've done, Senator Anderson, and good faith efforts that have gone on here, but I'm still having concerns. Others may as well. I want to see if anybody else wishes to testify either for or against uh, Senate File 197 at this time. Okay, I'm not seeing anybody in regards to that. So um, we're going to go ahead and uh, Senator Anderson, we, we did do the amendment. So um, that's the language which will be posted and will be available so that folks when they have comments uh, can still do that. 
And thank you very much for bringing the bill forward. Thank With you, Madam Chair. Thank you, members. Yep. I didn't give you a chance to make a final comment. So sorry, Senator Anderson. It's <laughs> customary if you wish to make an additional comment. No, thank you. I uh, appreciate the opportunity. And uh, as you mentioned, we'll continue to work on it. Uh, um, Mr. Fagnino and others uh, who've got mm -hmm. concerns uh, will work with uh, staff and uh, nonpartisan staff to come up with some, maybe some better wording. So, Right. Thank you, Senator Anderson. If there's something we can do that still protects uh, in regards to that, I'm glad to be helpful. Thank you. With thank that, you. members, uh, Senate File 197 is laid over. Uh, the next bill on the agenda is Senator Housley. Senator Housley, welcome to the committee. Glad to have you here today. And the bill that you have, I'll move Senate File 2862 in regards to electronic pull tabs. So with that, Senator Housley, if you want to go ahead, name and title for the audio record, and then proceed to present your bill. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to hear uh, Senate File 2862, a bill regarding electronic pull tab devices, games, and systems not subject to change in rules unless authorized by the legislature. Uh, this bill came from a good friend of mine, um, Representative Keith Frankie, who is also a bar and restaurant owner in uh, St. Paul Park. And when there was talk of pulling e-pull tabs from our bars and restaurants, um, the whole industry was like, what? You, you can't do that to us. Um, and, and to have uh, an unelected board um, do uh, deals somewhere other than the legislature to change things that were already in law um, upsets a lot more than, than um, just us here at the Capitol. Um, these e-pull tabs are so important to our, our youth sports, our disability services, our veterans, our firefighters, our organizations, and it supports um, the arts and so much more. The, the revenue that comes from these e-pull tabs really, really uh, supported those nonprofits and those youth sports organizations, and, and like I said, many, many more. But it also uh, supported our bars and restaurants during COVID. It was... Uh, they've, they've gone through hell and back, and uh, e-pull tabs, were, they were hanging on by a thread, and this really, really helped them during that time. So the bill, um, it prohibits the Gambling Control Board from deactivating or prohibiting e-pull tab devices, games, or game systems that had been approved by the board under the rules at the time of the approval, unless the legislature, by law, requires the devices, games, or game systems to comply with the later adopted rules. Um, a little bit more, it makes electronic pull tab games exempt from rules regarding cumulative or carryover prizes that are adopted after the game was approved, again, unless the legislature does this by law. And it also makes e-pull tab games exempt from rules relating to selection of winner by random selection that are adopted after the game was approved unless the legislature does this by law. So that's it. This was actually language that Representative Keith Frankie, in, in his rightful frustration with what could happen to our bars and restaurants and to all of the nonprofits, disability services, veterans, firefighters, and those organizations that benefit from e pull tabs. So I do have some testifiers, Mrs. Mrs. <laughs> Senator uh, Chair Kiffmeyer, if you want to call on them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Housley. It kind of reminds me of my grandkids down in Asheville, North Carolina. I'm, uh, they're, they're big into the Miss Mary. They don't call people by their first name. They're always Miss Mary. Miss Mary. Thank you. So with that, I'll go ahead and have uh, the Minnesota Gambling Control Board, Miss Wade, come on up. Uh, pages, if you go ahead and get additional chairs for our testifiers. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think we're just okay with, You're okay? with the one up here. Thank All you. All right. Okay, good. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair, for this opportunity to discuss Senate File 2862. Uh, Ms. Wade, um, in these committee hearing rooms, you need to lean into the microphone. <laughs> and if it sounds it. too loud for you, it's just right for everybody else. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. I don't like to be too loud. So. <laughs> no, but lean into it. We want to hear you. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Laura Wade, and I'm the Interim Executive Director for the Gambling Control Board. 
The Gambling Control Board's tradition and intention is to remain neutral on proposed legislation impacting the operation of the charitable gambling industry, except when asked to provide technical guidance on how proposed changes can best be implemented and regulated. Statute currently grants the Gambling Control Board authority to make rules that ensure that lawful gambling is conducted in the public interest. Senate File 2862 would diminish that authority and that it would require legislative approval for any rule changes related to the electronic pull tab devices, games, and systems. When opening the rules process, there are specific mandated procedures that the agency's seven-member citizen board uses to ensure that input from the industry, the public, and all other effective, affected parties is considered. The agency's goal is to adopt rules that clarify the practical application of statute to the conduct of charitable gambling. <coughs> An administrative law judge reviews all rules prior to implementation to ensure that they are consistent with existing statute and not contrary to it. The Gambling Control Board welcomes legislative clarification of current statute or codification of any existing rules that the legislature specifically wants to remain in place. This would provide the board with the guidance needed to ensure that future rule changes comply with legislative intent without restricting the board's rulemaking authority. The Gambling Control Board thanks you for the opportunity to provide our input on this bill and welcomes any follow-up questions you may have. Thank you, Chair Kiffmeyer. Thank you very much, Ms. Wade. I appreciate your testimony. Do you have other comments, sir? Um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Gary Danger, Compliance Officer at the board, just if there's any questions, here to okay. answer. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we'll go ahead then, and we will have the next testifier from the American Legion, Mr. Hart. And thank you for wearing your Legion cap today, hat. I'm not quite sure what the proper name is to call it, but I always like seeing it and remind Amazing. myself of the wonderful job you all do in our parades, leading the parades and presenting colors. You guys do such a good job. Welcome. You can go ahead, state your name and title for the audio record, and then proceed with your testimony. My name is Robert Hart, and I'm the legislative chairman for the uh, Department of Minnesota American Legion. I've also been the gambling manager for uh, the Stillwater Post 48, license number 00903, for nine of the last 12 years. I'm authorized to speak um, on behalf of the um, American Legion on gambling-related legislation. There's a high level of frustration with the rates of taxation and mandated costs that deprive our organizations of uh, hard-earned uh, funds that should be used and focused on veterans and charitable charities within our community. There are about 300,000 veterans in the state of Minnesota. Many of these count on programs sponsored by the veterans uh, uh, service organizations uh, the, which include 200 American Legion posts and about 100 VFW posts and, uh, you know, engaged in this activity. Electronic gaming in some markets is equal to paper pull tabs in revenue generation. In addition to supporting veterans organizations, support many community programs including sports, food shelves, scholarships, and many more. The American Legion supports passage of SF, I'm sorry, uh, 68, 2862. There are about 550 American Legion posts in Minnesota. That's over 500 communities. While not all are involved in charitable gambling, the members of those posts rely on uh, on those posts rely on Legion programs, largely funded uh, by gambling revenue. I thank you in advance for your support. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Appreciate it very much. And, uh, okay, um, we will then go to um, Ms. Tracy Wigan from Welcome to the Committee. And when you get yourself situated, take your time. Again, lean into the microphones till it sounds too loud for you. And then you can go ahead and state your name and title and proceed with your testimony. Yes, good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Senator Housley, for authoring this bill, SF 2862. 
My name is Tracy Wigan, and I'm the president of the Electronic Gaming Group, but today I testify on behalf of myself as a gambling manager for the last six years. I'm the gambling manager for <coughs> um, Competition Cheer Spirit Booster Club. We are the number one grossing charity in the city of Coon Rapids, and we have been able to bring cheerleading to those um, through our revenues and charitable gambling to those young people that cannot afford it. Um, usually you have to go to an elite gym to get the training that you need. We're all very excited that, I don't know if you've heard, but cheerleading might um, <clears throat> become an Olympic sport, so we're working towards that. It's exciting to me that we can assist these young people that might have not had a chance, and that's what it does for us. Um, electronic gaming has added revenue that we very much have needed to help our mission, and we have been able to bring our programs to many, many more people than we would have without it. Um, we support this bill and it is needed um, due to what we saw last session, the tactics, and while um, I do believe that Gambling Control Board does a fabulous job at following all the rules, um, I think that there are some vulnerabilities there and I think this would help further protect our revenue stream that has helped our youth. If any changes were to happen to electronic gaming, about 50% of our revenue would be cut off, and that would not be good for anyone's programs. Um, and I would like to just make a comment on the letter that is in the packets, and that um, I strongly disagree with their contention that the regulators have ignored both the letter and original intent of the law. I don't believe that to be true. If that were true, I would be right there with everyone else saying you're a wrong, you're doing things wrong. So I would like um, the committee to know that this is a very important bill and that it protects um, this revenue stream, this very important revenue stream. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Wigan. I appreciate your testimony today. And um, I don't have any questions for you right now. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're going to go ahead and have uh, Ray Bond uh, present. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Ray Bone, and I'm here representing the Electronic Gaming Group of Minnesota. And um, I would like to thank Senator Housley and Representative Frankie for bringing this bill forward. Uh, you know, as you all know, last session um, we had a fairly contentious uh, fight over uh, the, uh, the law as was agreed to by the tribes and the charities and then eventually the legislature. Uh, I too take umbrage at the letter we just received from the uh, Tribal Gaming Association. I don't know who Keith Anderson is who signed it, but I do know he was not in the room when we cut that deal. And uh, the original agreement was between the tribes and the charities. And then uh, when the final bill was agreed to, uh, our agreement was, was approved by the legislature and inserted in that bill, lock, stock, and barrel. And I do know, based upon the agreement that we had, uh, that we are not breaking the law. Uh, if the tribes believe today, if the casino tribes believe today they cut a bad deal, well, I'm sorry about that, but that was the deal. The, um, in addition to that, we were not the only ones in the room. Uh, the Gambling Control Board was also in the room. Uh, Director Barrett, for technical advice only, so they were well aware of what the, what the deal was, what the agreement was. And they're the ones that, of course, are being criticized now for not doing their job, which we disagree with 100%. They did do their job, and they are doing their job. They did a very good job. But unfortunately, we lost the executive director shortly after session. And we have concerns about that, and we have concerns about any um, potential new rulemaking, and, and in fact, the Gambling Control Board has started rulemaking again, and one of the things we believe they're going to look at are those the games that they previously approved. We just want to ensure 
that there's no political ma manipulation involved with the board. We're hearing lots of rumors going around and, and frankly makes us a little nervous. And we believe this legislation will provide additional protection, not only for the board, but for us as well. Now, this is a regulatory board, and it should not be susceptible to political manipulation. And I think um, this bill safeguards against that. Um, you know, the, the tribes, casino tribes, are our major con competitor. And we've always treated them that way, as such. And they continue to be our major competitor. And for example, yesterday we're hearing that the Sports betting is going to be basically turned over to them, lock, stock, and barrel. Plus, plus, they're going to have allow in the house side mobile betting, which has been anathema to to the legislators legislature in the past, because all of our gaming to date has always been destination, and when you start allowing people to play to bet at home in their basement. I think that's, that's a whole different step forward. And frankly, if the tribes are going to be allowed to do that, I think the thing that comes to my mind is why can't the charities? I mean, why can't the, we, we have very much the capacity to go to mobile gaming just like the tribes do. So, so I, think, uh, I think people need to pause when they look at this sports betting issue. Uh, I've asked the question of one of the authors, how is this going to affect the market share of charities? You know, because we're, you know, we're about market share too. Again, we have comp competitors. And I don't know. That's up to you to figure out. Well, I'm sorry. No, I mean, if you're making good pol public policy, uh, the authors of those bills need to figure that out and how it's going to affect many, many local communities. Um, We, we have another concern too, and that is the, the tribal cooperation agreement where, the, where the, uh, uh, the law that was put in the state, I think local government bill right at the end of session. That, we don't know what that's going to mean in terms of dealing with our, how the board, gambling control board is going to interface with the, uh, you know, with the tribes. I mean, are, do they get a special place at the table? Or how does that work? Uh, as, as all I know is we placed everybody on notice that, that everything better be open to the public, better be above board, and we're going to be making lots of data requests. Because that, that appears to me as though that makes a real, uh, gives them a real decided advantage. And in the world of competition, and that's what this is, uh, we don't like that. We don't like that. Uh, Again, the Gambling Control Board, we believe, has done a great job in implementing the uh, E-tabs. You know, when the E-tabs were passed, uh, it was a concept. They were just a concept. And, and if you all remember, those that have been around, what there was a lot of consternation about we weren't raising enough money right away. Well, that's, again, we went from concept to frankly, uh, implementation, and we had some bumpy starts. But now that we're on our way, we're frankly doing pretty well. And they're turning out just like we said that they would. They appeal to a, a, a new clientele, younger clientele. A lot of the younger people coming in have a lot of fun with them. A lot of the older ones have fun with it. So it's, it's a unique entertainment value. So um, we asked, you know, for the benefit of your communities and your charitable gambling organizations to do a lot of wonderful, great things in your communities that you support this legislation because we think it's going to provide us the kind of protection that we need. And I'd just like to add too, in discussions with Allied Charities in Minnesota, they also support this legislation. And we have 
we have a group of about uh, 14, 15 organizations who have coalesced this session, uh, all dealing with charitable gambling, um, that support it as well. We believe this is a good piece of legislation, and we hope that you will pass it. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I appreciate your testimony. I have a couple questions for you. So one of them is in regards to, if I understand, and since you've been around from the beginning of agreement, so you have a lot of history and knowledge, weren't there a couple court cases on this very subject uh, that, the, that the tribes, I believe, went to court, a couple cases? Could you explain that a little bit, what happened there? Well, um, Madam Chair, yes, there were two court cases during the um, development of rules and that process and that, of course, took a long time. Uh, and both court cases were, were basically thrown out by the administrative law judge. Now, you may ask the question, well, and I've asked that question to the tribe several times, is, you know, they wouldn't have had to stop there. If they felt so aggrieved, why didn't they take it to district court? or to the appellate court. I think, in fact, I think it would have gone directly to the appellate court. Mm -hmm. But you know what? They didn't. And I don't know if that has to do with their fear of discovery or what. Um, they did not. And okay. so uh, I would say that's been settled by the courts. And they the courts agreed with us. Right. I appreciate that. So, Mr. Bond, another question for you is, as mentioned here, rulemaking. So um, have there been any proposed rules made public at this stage? No, Madam Chair, what, what happened was um, they just started it, and then uh, Director Getman mysteriously resigned and left. Now, Director Getman was an extremely uh, strong and principled director. And I do know that he, he had intense pressure when, for example, last session, when he did the fiscal note, and some people didn't like the fiscal note. So as a result, um, I think he paid a price for it. That's my personal opinion, mm -hmm. he, and maybe a little more. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> so Mr. Bond, the question is, um, have you seen any proposed rules? Or are you referring to something else? What, what happened was they, they uh, have agreed to do rulemaking. Who, who is the, the board? Name? The Gambling Control Board has agreed okay. to do rulemaking. It's been sent to the rulemaking committee, is my understanding. And what happened was when Mr. Getman left, they, uh, the, the Gambling Control Board, decided to cease all rulemaking until they get a new executive director. And he left, um, he left the June of last year, and we do not have an executive director appointed yet. Okay. So until that new executive director is appointed, the Gambling Control Board does not want to move forward because they don't want to move forward and then a new executive comes in and says, oh, you're doing that all wrong. We shouldn't be doing it that right. way. So I that's what's going that. on. Thank you very much, Mr. Vaughn. I'm going to go to our next testifier, uh, Mr. Chesek. I want to be sure we get our testifiers in here. And I believe you're Madam, online. I am, Madam Chair. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you very well. That's wonderful. Um, uh, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Tony Chesnick. I am the executive director of the Minnesota Licensed Beverage Association, the MLBA. Represents small family owned and operated liquor retailers, both on premise bars and restaurants, and off premise liquor stores. Uh, I'm here in strong support of Senator Halsey's bill. It is simple and makes sense. Senate File 2862 provides legislative oversight on any and all major changes to electronic poll tax such as deactivation, which as uh, uh, Mr. Bowen just uh, eloquently put, we narrowly escaped last year. Uh, it was not for a large grassroots effort from liquor license holders, charities, parents, um, and key legislators, we would have been without our legalized charitable e-tabs, and that would have been devastating for the majority of charities and bars, especially during the pandemic. E-tabs are important for bars, restaurants, and charities, as it serve as a course, uh, and of course, the state of Minnesota. The MLB uh, pushed for legalized e-pull e tabs back in 2010, 2011, and we call that Movement Profit Minnesota. The goal is to make, to take paper pull tabs and bring them into the modern era. And as some of our, our, our industry folks described, uh, trying to put some warm butts in cold seats. Among losing them, uh, almost losing them last year would have put businesses, charities, employees, and yes, even the state of Minnesota in a very precarious position. We need to keep and serve our customers, 
keep our employees working and continue to support the missions of our, that our charities provide. ETABs have been around for a decade as additional revenue streams. Dozens and dozens of games have been vetted and approved over and over again by the Minnesota Gambling Control Board. Any major changes to rules of the game for these current pandemic struggling industries and charities would be unnecessary, irrational, and frankly quite unfair. Senator Halsey, thank you so much for championing this cause um, for our charities and for our license holders and putting a common sense layer of protection to safeguard and prevent the proverbial rug from being pulled out from underneath our MLBA members and charities and employees they support. Madam Chair and committee members, thank you so much for your consideration and time, and I'll stand to take questions if you have any uh, questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chesek. I really appreciate that. I think it kind of reminds me of the, you have the one piece of the charities, but then you also have the uh, local restaurants, the local bars and people like that, and the great hamburgers they have, things like that, that people go in whether they gamble or not. There's just a lot of community activity that goes on around this, um, especially in regards to the charitable piece of it. So thank you very much, appreciate that. Um, I was wondering also, we have a letter here from Minnesota Indian Gaming Association, Mr. Anderson. Uh, is Mr. Anderson present today, wishing to speak, or is it just the letter at this time? I'm kind of, just the letter? Okay. And so um, I wanted to, at this time, uh, comment in regards to this letter um, of rules and rulemaking. But before that, I'd like to have, again, Ms. Wade, if you could come up. And I'd like to, since you've heard some of the other testimony at this time, if you would come on up and talk about rulemaking and where you're at with the board. I think it'd be helpful to hear from you. I know you started and did some things, but after you hear the other testifiers sometimes, it's good to come on back and I'll respond to what you've heard today, especially in regards to the rulemaking, if you could. Ms. Wade. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, at this point in time, we have not brought forward any rules. Um, we have not started our rulemaking process or opened it. Um, Mr. Getman did leave in September of 21, um, and I've been in the interim position since then. And it is our strong opinion to not open the rules process until we do have a permanent director in place. Thank you, Ms. Wade. The other thing is that in regards to rulemaking, um, the legislature establishes the policy, right? Rulemaking usually does, you need a form or you need a process of some sort, but the policy has been addressed by the court and the legislature to this extent um, here in the Senate has supported this current policy. So I get a little bit concerned when people talk about rulemaking to go delve into uh, areas that touch contracts and areas that have already been ruled on by the courts. Uh, but I think it's a good thing that you have not, then this is a really good time to pass this bill because it gives clear legislative guidance in regards to the intent of this legislature. Uh, I call it sometimes a belts and suspenders approach uh, to be sure that there is without any, under, without misunderstanding and also in regards to having this hearing as well. Um, would you, sir, would you also like to address this issue? Um, my name is Don Click. I am the executive assistant at the Minnesota Gambling Control Board and I am the um, staff rules um, coordinator. And I came on with the board in August under Mr. Getman and we had discussed the possibility of opening the rules. We had started talking to the board. However, when Mr. Getman left in September, it was decided that we would hold off on any type of rules making until such time as we had a new executive director. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I, I would just express that how important it is uh, that rule making will generally take any uh, quite a while, up to two years. It's expensive. And so coming to the legislature, so um, as chair of this committee, um, as you may have noticed, we do have bills before us. And so if there is something in regards to, instead of going to rulemaking, if there are some, which is not infrequent, some technical issues that you might like to address, it is not too late to do that, uh, to bring something like that forward at this time, and then rulemaking would not be necessary because you can go through. And both the House and the Senate are very welcome to those kinds of um, technical cleanups or 
process things. So I want to encourage you in regards to that, whatever you might have been thinking about with Mr. Getman, to please bring them forward, uh, bring them to my staff, uh, Mr. Bjorn or um, whatever, or to myself, et cetera, and would be glad to consider some of those things. And it's a by far and cheaper way uh, to go ahead and come through us here in the legislature. Uh, Senator Housley, I understand. Thank you very much, Ms. Wade. Appreciate that very much. Um, thank you for being here. And by the way, members, being here in person is really helpful. Welcome, Senator Carlson. Glad to have you here. Um, because some of the technical issues and some of those things, um, being here in person and able to um, respond to those things, uh, just there's no duplicate. Zoom just can't really handle some of those things very well. But as I understand it, Senator Housley, we may have. An amendment? Uh, Madam Chair and members, yes. Um, Ms. James, would she's got a technical amendment to clear things up, so we just had a little side meeting which way we wanted it to go, and it's actually on line point 211. Um, after that is where I think she has it ready to go. Thank you, Senator Housley. We'll just have Ms. James go ahead and explain the amendment. And I'm also waiting to make sure that it is posted and available for committee members. and. Madam Chair and members, um, I've just emailed the amendment okay. to the state government getting printed group, and, posted. and we're also getting it printed. Okay, so uh, Ms. James, would you explain what the amendment is, though? Madam Chair, yes. Um, the amendment uh, on, on three places in the bill, there is reference to authorization coming from the legislature by law. And so it wasn't entirely clear if that meant action solely by the legislature and not requiring a governor's signature or whether it meant by law, which would be an action by the legislature and then signed by the governor. So Senator Housley would like to clear that up by making it clear that it's a law passed by the legislature and signed by the governor. And so the amendment will do that in those three places. Okay. Uh, we're getting that posted. Um, Senator Housley, members, any questions at all uh, members have about the bill? Uh, you've heard the oral explanation of the amendment, uh, striking mainly the legislature and just leaving the law, I would expect, in some for form, Ms. James. Yeah. So, it, members, uh, any questions about that? I'm not seeing any at this time. And, um, Senator Housley, we're going to take action on that amendment, and that amendment then clears up some questions that we had about the bill. Um, and, and we're going to um, both keep it, it, it stays automatically being heard in this committee within the jurisdiction of this committee, but we're also going to um, take a vote on this bill. We're going to move it off to um, general orders um, as well. So if this is ready, Ms. James? Amendment has been posted. It's been explained by our general counsel. Uh, what number is it? So members on the A1 amendment to Senate file... That's Senate File 2862. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion prevails. The A1 amendment is adopted. Senator Housley, to your bill 2862 as amended for final comments. And then we're going to go ahead for a vote. Thank you so much, Madam Chair and members, for um, hearing this bill. Um, Senator or Representative Frankie would also like to thank you. Uh, and just while I was sitting here, I got a text from um, the vice president from our largest youth sports organization in the state. And she said um, these e pull tabs have allowed for them to build their dome for their kids to play soccer and hockey in. And it also allows for them to give 100% free sports res registration to those families that can't afford it or lose a parent or guardian. And it's, it's so important to more than just our youth sports that was said earlier, our veterans and our firefighters and, and so many nonprofits. And, and passing this bill will ensure, they're all on pins and needles. They've been on pins and needles since last year, worried if this is going to go away. And it, it would devastate so many, uh, so many folks and our, our bars and restaurants. Um, so, so this legislation would provide um, protections and safeguards against that happening. So I want to thank you again, Madam Chair, for hearing this and uh, uh, Ms. James for that great amendment that will make it very clear. Madam Chair. Thank uh, Senator Coran. Madam Chair, uh, before we go to vote, I'd like to request the roll call. 
Okay, roll call being requested, roll call granted. Um, Senator Housley, I would agree that the bill is and the amendment uh, clarifying that, those are those things that uh, we as legislators are very grateful that our wonderful staff t look at those things for us. Appreciate that. So with that, members, um, okay, we'll call. Ms. Uh, Wilson, if you call the roll. Senator Kiffmeyer. Aye. Senator Howe. Senator Carlson. No. Senator Clausen. No. <coughs> Senator Fateh. No. Senator Curran. Yes. Senator Pratt. Aye. Senator Osmick. Aye. Senator Howe. Senator Howe was presenting a bill in another committee. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. He is excused for the vote then. Okay, there being four ayes and three noes, uh, the bill is passed, Senate file 2862, and is on to general orders. Thank you, Senator Housley. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. As amended. <laughs> All right, 2862. Our last bill on the, our third bill on the agenda today is Senator Coran, Senate File 3468. Okay, Senator Coran, as a member of the committee, you can go ahead and present your bill and make thank, your motions. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to move Senate File 3468. And for the audio record to state your name, et cetera. Uh, State Senator Mark Curran. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. uh, Madam Chair, we have uh, happy to present uh, Senate File 3468. It's a fairly straightforward bill. Um, what this bill does is it simply appropriates all the dollars remaining in a state data security, um, a data security account to the Office of the Legislative Auditor. Um, the appropriation itself actually comes from a special revenue fund funded by fees related to bulk data. And this money is intended to be used for um, audits, audits on our program, so it makes sense to really move this appropriation forward. Um, and to the appropriate auditing entity, which is the Office of the Legislative Auditor. Um, the change actually provides about $225,000 uh, annually to the Legislative Auditor, um, but it also includes another. $100,000 um, because there's an accumulated balance of about $1.3 million into this fund. And, uh, and then the other component to it is it also, um, in, in addition to approving the, the dollars, it eliminates the duties for the legislative audit uh, related to driver and vehicle services. And Madam Chair, this was a recommendation and approved and, uh, by the chair of the Senate um, Transportation Committee as well, or as a recommendation from him. So everybody's on board with moving these funds and making the appropriation available. So we can get great audits. And uh, as you know, serving on the Legislative Audit Commission, uh, we have a, a deficit of resources to be able to provide eyes and ears. And this, this change allows for additional capacities in the Office of the Legislative Auditor. Thank you very much, Senator Coran. And absolutely we do, and matter of fact, on a very bipartisan basis, um, uh, members appreciate the work of the Office of the Legislative Auditor. So speaking of which, we have one of the legislative auditors with us today, Ms. Lyson. Uh, if you want to proceed, again, name, title, and then give your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Lori Lyson. I am the Deputy Legislative Auditor for the Financial Audit Division at the Office of the Legislative Auditor. I want to thank the committee for their time today and allowing me to testify and to Senator Cran for introducing this bill. Um, as Senator Cran said, this, the state data security account was established in 2014 and there was revenue directed to the Office of the Legislative Auditor. However, the governor had vetoed the appropriation language. And so as a result of that, no one has had the authority to access this account. And the balance, as Senator Cran said, is currently at approximately 1.3 million. 
$1.3 million. Um, so by appropriating the revenue to our office, it's allowing us to, one, um, increase the number of positions. We would like to add an additional three positions. And then the other would be to add additional audits so that we would be able to do um, additional audits within a year. Um, and so the flexibility that this would allow us to do is increase our positions in either the financial audit division or in special reviews. So those applicants that we'll be looking for are those that have financial audit backgrounds, IT audit backgrounds, or fraud investigations. Um, so currently, we're actively recruiting for financial auditors, and then we also have recently uh, hired somebody, an additional staff member, in the special reviews area. So thank you for your time today, and then open for any questions. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Leitch, being stricken that actually uh, was subject to available funds appropriate, the legislative auditor shall. And so you can tell the original intent on the data security account in the special revenue fund was that this work would be done by the Office of the Legislative Auditor. My understanding of the issue is it's been hung up and not been appropriated to the Legislative Auditor. So you've had the requirement to do this work, but without the funds to do it. That's my understanding of the impact of this bill. Uh, Ms. Lyson, is that how you read it as well? That is correct, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Lyson. Uh, any other members, uh, comments or anything at all uh, in regards to Senate File 3468? Okay. Um, Senator Coran, my understanding is we've carried this language in our um, state government uh, bill before, uh, but it was your intention also to have it move separately to Finance Committee. Is that something that you would still like to do, is move it separately to Finance Committee? Is there... Uh, anything else further you would like to comment on? Madam Chair, if we could move it to the finance, that'd be great. I think it's a it's one of these uh, opportunities when the revenues are sitting there waiting to be used, and we have a highly valuable resource that is being underutilized. And so, whatever we can do to make sure that that it has a clear path to be able to get this passed, and so those dollars can be appropriated, we'll take your your guidance. Yeah, for thank your you, Senator Cran. I think uh, in this case, again, we've carried this before. My intention would be. In giving it a hearing, we will continue uh, to carefully watch this because I think it's just really a right thing to do, a needed thing to do. Um, but uh, on that same kind of mindset, though, thinking that this bill would also be good to go to the Finance Committee uh, at this time. And so I think we're going to um, dual track it, and I just need to seek counsel here. Well, according to counsel from our staff here, uh, we are going to move it out of committee, but it is going to transportation. And I will see you there, Senator Coran, as well. So that'll be good to be able to have a voice uh, into a transportation committee. And that's because of the, uh, some of the duties that were included in this language include the Department of Public Safety. But uh, Mr. Erickson, would you like to comment more on its route to transportation? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I think you identified the reason. There's some duties um, where the appropriation, or if there's an appropriation to be made, requires the Department of Public Safety to, um, to do a couple of things and for the reports from the legislative auditor to go back to the Department of Public Safety. Um, so by removing those, the, the committee over there should, should hear that first. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. I think being on the Transportation Committee, I'm aware of some of this and some of these things. Now, Ms. Lyson, my understanding is I think some of these audits, subject matters here are being addressed in other ways. Could you comment on that, Ms. Lyson? Yes, Madam Chair, definitely we are able to do audits. Um, we have done an audit most recently in 2020 on the bulk data sales and can continue to do so. Um, and so we have the flexibility and discretion to do audits of DPS, Department of Public Safety. Thank you, Ms. Lysa. I think it would be helpful if you could just get the funding uh, to be able to do that as well um, without that. Okay, thank you very much. I'm not seeing any other questions or comments from any other members. So with that, uh, we're going to go ahead and take a vote. Madam Chair, I'd like to move my bill. Senator Coran, just a moment. I'm going to have you make final comments first, and I was just checking if there was any amendments. So Senator Coran, I'll go to you first, and then you can make your motion. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I think this is just a great common sense uh, opportunity to move those available funds. I've been sitting there for six years, and we've missed highly valuable opportunities to provide a greater in-depth look at the function of government, and that's what the Office of the Legislative Auditor does. They're our greatest eyes and ears for not only the legislative body, but for the citizens of this state. And so with that, Madam Chair, I would like to move the bill. Um, uh, I'd like to move Senate File 3468 be recommended to pass and referred to the Transportation Committee. All right, thank you. And on that motion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion prevails. Senator Cran, you're on your way to transportation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Cran. So members, with that, we do have um, a hearing tomorrow. The committee notice has gone out. Uh, we have um, some agency bills that will be on our future agendas. Uh, we'll also, I've been notified by the governor's office that the governor's budget is also, uh, has been jacketed and able now to go ahead and be introduced. Um, so we're, we're gonna have some full agendas uh, this week and next as we wind ourselves to our first deadline, which I think is March 25th. First deadline is March 25th, so we'll have a busy March. Uh, we're gonna be having a number of other bills as well. And also our committee has many re-referrals that are required to come to our committee uh, for a certain portion of that bill and then move on its way out uh, as they have. So we are working, staff are working with other staff to help make sure that we facilitate the timeliness of getting those bills moved through. So members, with that, um, we have finished our committee business and I yield back the balance of the committee hearing time to your good work and we are adjourned. <laughs>